Thanks to the GSV and ASU teams for hosting this event and inviting me. Uh, it's a remarkable pivot that the teams have done to bring this size operation and conference online in response to the pandemic. And even though I do miss seeing everyone in person down in Sunday, sunny San Diego, uh, the event has really expanded and it's really created a lot more opportunity and access to hear more voices and to share more voices in ways that we might not have thought possible even just a year ago. And so in that sense, the pandemic is really changing things in so many ways. And this conference, to some degree, is emblematic of what's possible in the new digital era. And to wrap up the conference, I'd like to wrap it up on an optimistic note. In fact, I'd like to propose that the pandemic has issued in a new era of possibilities that hold the promise of greater social equity. Now, even though I can't read your body language, I can feel virtual skepticism creeping through my internet connection. And this is not without good reason. If you look at what's been published, a lot of the emerging surveys, uh, and even just this Monday in the Wall Street Journal, we're seeing long pieces that really demonstrate the disparate impact that the pandemic has had on what the Wall Street Journal calls the haves and the have-nots. And it paints a harrowing picture of how the pandemic has worsened the digital divide with, uh, within our communities. Even before the pandemic, there has been a growing divide between highly educated and less educated workers, a divide that threatens to grow because of technology and automation. And here's a slide that I often like to use. It's from McKinsey. It looks at the risk of automation by job against the income level of workers. What you can see is a chart where the size of the bubbles is the number of people in the US who hold a certain job. The color of the bubble is the typical education level of people who hold that job. What immediately jumps out are the large red circles in the lower right. These are folks with generally a, uh, less than a college degree, often not even having a high school diploma. They're cashiers, they're admin assistants, they're freight movers, they're doing a lot of the frontline work. They're in low paying jobs, they're almost certainly going to be automated because of technology. This contrasts with the bubbles in the upper left, these blue bubbles, these college educated people earning very high incomes who have jobs that are not very likely to be threatened by automation. And although many people talk about, and it's true that digital will create many new jobs, it's important that people have the skills to earn those jobs. And unless we can retrain people who will lose their jobs from automation to give them digital skills, we can easily see a scenario where we have very high unemployment rates simultaneously with very high open positions in digital jobs because there just aren't skilled people to fill them. So reskilling is incredibly important. Now on this longer trend of automation, we have seen a dramatic and immediate impact due to the, the coronavirus. Uh, this is a chart from the Wall Street Journal article that shows the unemployment impact that has been experienced by people in the US with different levels of education. You can see the precipitous drop for people who have less than a high school diploma, it's crawling back. But look at the folks who have college degrees. There was a minor deterioration, in, uh, increase in the unemployment rate, but it has bounced back and is almost back to normal. The International Labor Organization estimates that over 300 million people might lose their jobs due to the pandemic. And a recent study by the University of Chicago has suggested that perhaps up to 40% of the lost jobs will never come back. So it's easy to feel pretty um, concerned, and we should be, uh, but it's also possible to have some hope. And the UN Secretary General said that COVID is an opportunity to build back a more equal and sustainable world. He says that education and digital technology must be two great enablers and equalizers. And I agree with this, and I will take it one step further. Technology has not only changed forever the way that teachers teach and students learn, technology has also changed forever the way that workers work and who can access jobs. And I believe that these twin pillars of online education and remote work create an opportunity to increase social equity on an unprecedented scale. 
So first, let's talk a little bit about the promise of online learning. In April of 2020, UNESCO, who tracks uh, campus education, campus openings and closings during the, uh, the COVID pandemic, said that on April 20th, 1.6 billion students had their school campuses closed. This is almost every student in the world. It's 91% of all students and campuses in virtually every country. Unfortunately, few schools were offering online learning at the time. This is a quick snapshot from US schools in 2018. And fewer than half of most educators in higher education had ever taught online. So it's not that the, in, the industry was well prepared for what ensued. We got a call, I got a call from Matthew Raskoff at Duke, one of our partners who has a joint venture with Wuhan University in China and their Kunshan campus on January 27th was quarantined. And he called and he said, hey, Jeff, we just got quarantined, all the students, all the professors, we need to keep teaching online. Can we offer Coursera for Campus, which is a catalog of about 4,000 courses that is available to campuses, can we offer that for, for free? We convened all of our partners who have authored courses on Coursera and everyone agreed, we should totally come to the aid of our fellow educators. It was a great success. And after that, although I didn't real, realize it quite at the time, uh, the pandemic spread globally and almost all universities were affected. What we did is we convened again our university partners and we said, let's take this on a global scale. Let's make Coursera for Campus available to any college or any university in the world that has been impacted by COVID. And the response has been really amazing. We had 30 customers in February of 2020. That has grown to 3,700 institutions using for Coursera for Campus. 2.4 million students have enrolled in courses. And since March 12th, 16 million free course enrollments have taken place all around the world. So it is really amazing how technology can help bridge some of these types of shocks that we've seen. In addition to institutions going and looking to Coursera for help, individuals themselves directly came to Coursera as well. As is the case with many online providers like Coursera, we had massive increases in demand from learners, up 470% from the same period a year ago, 58 million enrollments, especially we saw a lot of demand among learners who were new to Coursera, who were checking out online learning for the first time. So we've seen a major shift to online learning. It's a shift that I think will persist. And I think it's a shift that will create much more access and opportunity for students and institutions around the world. Let's quickly focus on the promise of remote work. So I will tell you as the CEO of a company of more than 700 people, and a, I know a lot of other CEOs as well, remote work is here to stay. Not for every company, not for every job, but broadly speaking, it has been a tremendous experiment which has shown the promise of remote work. Uh, a recent McKinsey study of employers and employees suggested that 62% of employed Americans worked at home during the crisis, 80% said they were happier doing it, 69% they were said they were as productive or more productive, and organizations, of course, when you look at real estate, commute, travel, t &E, uh, a lot of money can be saved. So, it is not theoretical. Uh, Coursera for one and many other companies will forever be changed because of the opportunities that now exist with remote working. Now, not every job can be done remotely. The University of Chicago put out a great study that really analyzes different job roles and different job tasks. And on the y-axis here, you see the ability to work from home. On the x-axis is average income. What you see are that skilled jobs, digital jobs, often can be done remotely. And so a lot of what we need to do if we wanna create the ability for more people to work remotely is to help them get skilled for skilled jobs. Of course, the key here is if you can learn online and if you can work remotely, then you can actually learn new skills and get economic opportunity without having to leave your community. It means that you won't have to move to a high rent district like Mountain View, California to get a good paying tech job. If we can create the skills to help people become qualified for these positions, they will have the freedom to pursue job opportunities that are many, many times larger than anything that many communities have ever experienced. A recent chart from Microsoft shows that jobs requiring digital skills are some of the fastest growing jobs. 
from 41 million jobs today in digital skills, within five years growing to 190 million, a net increase of 149 million new jobs in the digital sector. I won't read through the list, but you can see software engineering and cybersecurity data analysts being big contributors. So then there's a question of, well, how do we get people these digital skills? We don't have the full answer, but I think we have glimpses of something that is working and is working at scale. We call them on Coursera gateway credentials. They're a path to digital jobs. This really started in January of 2018 with Google and what they call the Google IT Support Professional Certificate. It's a five month fully online training program that teaches somebody with no college degree and no background in computers how to get the skills to do a IT support job. Many entry level IT support jobs can be done remotely. What we've seen has been pretty stunning. Since we and Google launched this on Coursera in 2018, we've seen over 300,000 course enrollments with very broad representation of people who don't have college degrees, who are black, Latinx, female veterans, and who make very, very um, low average incomes. 45% of them made less than $35,000 per year. Now, many people might say, yeah, but this is online. A lot of people need personal coaching. You're right, many people do need personal coaching. So what we've done is we've partnered with what we call workforce development partners, where we provide with Google the online tools and training, and then certain partners like Goodwill and Merit America and community colleges provide that student services and the personal touch, but not to every student, only the students that really need it. What this model allows learners to get is a very quick, fully online way where anyone, anywhere, at any time can earn a certificate from industry and get a career pathway to over 65 companies that are looking to hire IT professionals that Google and I uh, and, and Coursera have pulled together. There's also a credential pathway, a degree pathway, where a number of our university partners have said, we will award academic credit for anyone who finishes the Google IT cert. We think that this could really change the basic structure of how many adults experience education from industry to universities, where often they will first get a job based on a professional certificate, and then while they will, are working and without quitting their job, they can pursue their college degree online. We started with the Google IT support in 2018. We've learned a ton. We have not perfected the model, but we've learned a lot about what makes it work. We're delighted that we're now live with three additional gateway professional certificates with IBM, including, for instance, cybersecurity and data analysts. We just launched the Facebook social media marketer certificate. There's a lot of open positions with social media marketers that do not require a college degree and any background in the field. We just went live with the Salesforce sales development representative professional certificate. Google just announced three additional gateway professional certificates in UX data analysis and software project management. And I'm happy to announce today that we just signed another deal with Intuit for an Intuit bookkeeper professional certificate. So these are not all computer programming jobs, but they're all jobs that could be done digitally, jobs that could lead to good careers and jobs that also might allow you to earn a college degree even when you're making a decent pay. So we think that there is a real promise that might follow this pandemic where the combined force of online learning and remote work might actually increase social equity around the world. Thank you very much. And I'd like to welcome Steve Lohr from the New York Times, who graciously agreed to do a little bit of a fireside with keynote mix, just to keep it a little bit uh, more lively. Steve, welcome. Great, thanks Jeff, appreciate it. Uh, a fascinating presentation. Um, uh, we hope that it comes true uh, in, in some timeline. Um, let me ask, uh, Coursera, given the size of its marketplace, uh, the breadth and depth of, uh, of, of what you do with online learning and, and skills enhancement, I mean, nobody has a broader, deeper look about what works and what doesn't than you do, arguably. So just you know, who succeeds and why and what succeeds and why? Yeah, a lot of different ways we can look at that question. One of the neat things about being at Coursera is that our business model is really an ecosystem of learners, educators, and then institutions 
We have 71 million learners. We have 150 universities and 50 industry partners who are authoring courses. And now on the institution side, we have thousands of companies, hundreds of governments, and now thousands of universities who are actually using this content to transform talent. So we see into learners and educators and these institutions. When we say kind of what's working, one of the things that at a macro level is really critical is to realize that different learners have different needs. Some will come directly to a website, you know, kind of B2C, business to consumers, but many, many learners really need to learn in an institutional context. So I think it's essential, it was essential for Coursera to not just remain B2C, even though we're seeing greater growth in B2C than almost any other part of our business, that institutional setting of businesses and governments and campuses is essential for many workers. And it's not even just the institution separately, but the way that institutions collaborate with them, with them, with each other. So one of the neat things about Coursera for Campus is you have universities relying on content from other universities to provide education to students. A neat thing about workforce development is you have governments tying in with businesses to help job placement for people that are being upskilled. A neat thing about campuses and businesses is you have businesses helping to design the curriculum for universities so that the graduates are gonna be more employable. So I'd say collaboration is a really big part of it, not just uh, between Coursera and individuals, but among the institutions that are on the Coursera platform. And incentives from some of the work you've done are important as well, I think. It, it, you know, the numbers are, you know, the early days of the MOOCs, you know, 10% or less of people ever compute, co completed these courses. And, it, and I think it's up to half or more than half if someone has at least paid something. Right, right? yes. You join, yeah. I mean, so sketch out a little bit about from the individual side what the, what the incentives are like that, again, and the, and the assistance that, that, you know, that seems to succeed. Yeah, it's, it's really different depending on the individual. But here are some uh, examples and completion rates that suggest the very wide variety of completion rates that are consistent with a very wide variety of incentives and motivations. Uh, what we see among individuals who directly to come to come to Coursera and take our partners' courses for free is completion rates generally uh, in the 10-ish percent range. Uh, but when they pay for it, to your point, they go to 50, 60 percent. When you look at individuals at work who are taking courses because their employers suggested that they should learn skills to advance their careers, you see completion rates of 50, 60 percent. When you look at universities who are offering degrees on Coursera, students in degree programs who really want that degree, they're serious about this, completion rates are basically 100%. An interesting um, natural experiment that we saw was that JHU, Johns Hopkins University in the School of Public Health, teamed up with the state of New York to create a contact tracing mm -hmm. uh, pro uh, program. It's a course that's free, it's about five hours. And on the B2C side, anyone could just take it for free. You, anyone on this call can go and take the course. It's a great course, I've taken it. Completion rates are about 50% for that free course because it's short and a lot of them are thinking about becoming contact tracers. But when you do the free contact tracing course as part of a training program with a public health agency, we see completion rates above 95%. Mm. So if there's a good reason to either get a job, advance your job, or as a student getting credit towards a degree, you see really high completion rates. Many others are really just kind of checking out the learning and the completion rates are a bit lower. What, what's needed either both from an institutional standpoint, attitudes, government policy that would accelerate this, uh, you know, the hopeful picture which you've sketched out? Well, I think a lot of the hopeful picture so far has emerged from experimentation. I mean, it's people willing to take a risk, invest money, and I'll, and I'll start you know, personally and somewhat selfishly, I'll, I'll start with the founders of Coursera, Daphne Kohler and Andrew Ng, and the founder of Udacity, Sebastian Thrum, and the founder of edX, Anant Agrawal. They all kind of boldly started a new experiment and no one knew how it was gonna turn out. And then many universities joined these platforms and they joined this experiment realizing we don't know what the future would hold. Now, many dismissed MOOCs after maybe the first couple of years. Oh, it's just a fad. There's not gonna, they're not going to make any money, et cetera. As Bill Gates has said, people often overestimate the impact in the first two years and underestimate the impact within the first 10 years. And I think this is a perfect case of what's happening with MOOCs. So experimentation is a first most important thing 
then sharing the learnings and collaborating is essential to make progress and increase what I call the rate of learning. In terms of policy, I think governments who make it not only okay, but support allowing online learning to count as credit towards college degrees is really big. India has been making major strides in trying to increase their gross enrollment ratio by bumping up the allowable credit that can be earned online towards a degree from from zero to 20% and then 20 to 40%. That puts a huge stimulus on the demand side of universities wanting online content. In South Africa, we're seeing wonderful regulatory policies with respect to mobile carriers, where the government is saying, if you want to be a mobile carrier in our country, you need to zero rate educational sites. Mm -hmm. So education downloads or downloading data from educational sites should cost our citizens nothing. Make your money on other types of media and entertainment. I think these types of policies are really valuable, but mostly it is about innovation, experimentation, and sharing what works that's going to make the biggest difference, in my opinion. And, you know, who's doing who's doing things really right? I mean, are there sort of models and examples that you point to um, either uh, as a nation or uh, within uh, corporations, institutions, educational institutions? Yeah, I would say that uh, across our sort of ecosystem, if I think about on the content side, our education partners, uh, a university who's who's really just a juggernaut is University of Michigan. They have hundreds and hundreds of courses on Coursera, and they are producing more courses than anybody else. And they've now kind of reached a critical mass where uh, the president just declared in his second term, his mandate is to end educational privilege. And as part of that mandate, he put an additional 50 million into an online learning center, uh, their, their, their academic innovation center, headed up by James Devaney. And they are doing spectacular work. They are experimenting, they're learning, they're building hybrid cross-disciplinary programs. Their uh, economic returns are very high because they're building great quality and high de- in, uh, in-demand courses. So I would look to them as a, as a great example. There are many others, but Michigan stands out. Uh, and then on the industry partner side, I mean, Google has been a tremendous success, uh, not only with their IT professional gateway cert, but they have all of their Google Cloud platform is on Coursera. And so it is both for these entry level professional certificate programs, but also the most advanced Google Cloud machine learning, security, uh, architecture programs and certifications uh, you can learn online. So that's really great examples there. Uh, In terms of businesses, I would point out Novartis has been amazing. Uh, They are big betting on uh, on online learning. They bought uh, Coursera for all their employees and all the friends, and I don't say friends, I think family of their employees. And so they're just making a a really big bet. And many of the businesses, I mean, there's just so many examples we could talk about. I'll stop in a second. You can probe a little bit more if you want. But the businesses that are focused first on who needs what skills Those are the businesses with much more strategic focus to say, I need to upskill my software engineers to learn machine learning, and then I need to upskill my marketers to learn digital marketing, and then I need to upskill my product managers to learn agile software development. The ones who say, I need people to learn stuff. It's a good start, but the ones, the businesses who are doing really well are thinking about job roles and skills and tools and being very intentional about what their teams are learning. What do you see in terms of uh, the shift toward what people have talked about a lot in terms of a move to a skills-based labor market? I mean, you referenced uh, uh, with the Google program in your presentation and elsewhere that, you know, a large portion of these people are, uh, have, do not have four-year college degrees. That's true of two-thirds of the American workforce. And, you know, the challenge is sort of, you know, pathways to good jobs, the modern economy for those people. Um, what, you know... What do you see in terms of change in attitudes? I mean, a handful of companies will say, well, we don't, you know, we don't take college degrees anymore. It doesn't matter. But, you know, it, it still seems like it's a pretty, you know, prevalent screen, is it not? I think it totally is. And, and, and some might say, oh, yeah, it's just a screen because it's a credential that signals that you got in and you persisted. And maybe you had you know, certain advantages to, to, to be able to persist through a four year degree program that's very competitive. Uh, I do think there'll be higher and higher demand for degrees, by the way, as, uh, as, as the pandemic reduces job opportunities, creates more competition for jobs, and as automation automates more of the lower end jobs, there'll be more people looking for jobs and looking to distinguish themselves in the labor market. 
generally speaking, what that does is it produces a need to have credentials that distinguish oneself. So I think the degrees are going to be in higher demand, not lower demand. It does not mean that micro credentials, you know, sub degrees and industry certificates will not be important. My opinion is we're going to have a lot more learning and a lot more credentials of a lot more shapes, including ones that stack into each other. So I think there's a really big and growing demand for credentials. And some people I also think are overemphasizing the when, when they think of skills, it's not just, you know, do you know statistics and do you know how to code? I think we might find a world where um, some, some educators call it far transfer. The things that you learn about being human, about yourself, about history, about how to talk and work with people turn out to be more difficult to observe skills, but incredibly valuable in the workplace. I think a real potent combination will be people who have college degrees and they've got that good liberal arts background and also have certain specializations and basic fluency in computers and tech and data science. science. But I do not think that we should take our educational system and start creating all computer scientists. I think there's a really incredibly valuable, I mean, I was an English major, so I'm speaking a little bit from personal bias, uh, but even as an employer, I think people are good, ed- good communicators, good influencers, have good work ethic, who are honest, who are ethical, and be good old fashioned values who can relate to people. That's invaluable. And I think it'll become more valuable, not less in the years ahead. Uh, Jeff, uh, we've got uh, just a couple of minutes left and we have a couple of, uh, we have questions from the audience. I mean, uh, I think the first one you answered, which was about what structural changes are needed. Uh, but this one just came in. You mentioned uh, collaborative learning. Well, Coursera published its catalog and learner ratings data publicly to help uh, move the space forward in service of the individual, similar yeah. to how airlines make their flight schedules available in machine-readable format. I, I, I love the question. I don't know if that was planted by someone on our team. Um, Man, first, <laughs> first, first, I'm joking, but I, you know, you never know. Uh, I, I, uh, first of all, I'll say every course on Coursera published by our partners uh, has a description page. On the description page are learner ratings and learner reviews. It's all totally open. Also on the author dashboard for all the instructors who publish those courses, not only do they get to see all the ratings, they get to see all the analytics that correlate, well, who gave people different ratings? And the learners can also type in personal feedback for the instructors. So Feedback loops are an incredibly important part of assessing quality and improving quality as well. I'll also say that we just published what we call our uh, our drivers of quality report. So uh, we've had over 200 million enrollments since Coursera was founded. And we have, because all the courses are pretty well structured and we can identify in a database the different features. How many have a video lecture? How long are the video lectures? How many have quizzes? How many have group projects? How many have this? How many have that? The data science team basically did a big study to say quantitatively what types of of features of online courses best predict learner satisfaction with those courses. And so it's a great report and and it says a lot of great things about making sure you have clear learning objectives and chunking up your stuff into small pieces and don't make it too difficult or or, or too uh, too easy. Uh, But anyone who wants to see it, it's a free report. You can see it on Coursera.org. Uh, Jeff, I think we may have just time for uh, for one more question, and it's from, uh, from the audience. It's from Gary Boholz. Can Coursera help learners in developing economies who often don't have reliable connectivity and limited access to uh, uh, to new work opportunities? Go to Zoomtopia on October fourteenth. We will announce something that will directly address that question. Okay, great. Okay. I think our time is out and a little bit past. So thanks very much, Jeff. Appreciate thanks for joining us, Steve. I really appreciate it too.